글로벌 인재 포럼 2011 셋째 날 행사 이 트랙 B의 세 번째 세션을 시작하겠습니다. 저는 소개받은 어, 한국경제신문 한경아카데미 권영설입니다. 제가 지난해까지는 바로 이 자리에서 이 포럼 사무국장을 맡았습니다. 그 올해가 여섯 번째 포럼인데 여러분들께서 성원해 주셔서 자리를 잡아가는 것 같아 아주 기쁘게 생각합니다. 트랙비는 이 기업 세션으로 마련됐습니다. 인재 이슈 가운데서 기업들이 민감하게 여기고 있는 주제를 골라서 국내외 전문가들로부터 최신 트렌드를 듣고 새로운 대안을 모색하는 트랙입니다. 이 기업 트랙의 세 번째 주제는 리크루팅의 기술입니다. 어떻게 인재를 뽑고 또 계속 유지할 것인가에 대한 문제인데요. 교재에 살짝 소개되어 있습니다만 어, 갤럽의 조사 얘기를 한번 상기해 보시죠. 갤럽은 지난 20여 년간 뛰어난 성과를 낸 수천여 명의 기업 간부들을 대상으로 어떻게 그들이 성공적인 성과를 낼수 있었는지에 대해서 인터뷰와 연구를 통해서 조사를 했습니다. 당초 이들이 가설로 세웠던 것은 성공적인 간부들은 탁월한 전략이나 또는 혁신 추진력 또 부드러운 소통 능력 등이 비결일 것이다 이렇게 생각을 했는데 막상 결과를 보니까 성공적인 간부들의 공통적인 특징은 어떻게 어, 리크루팅이었습니다. 기업들로 보면 어떻게 인재를 제대로 뽑아서 적재적소에서 오래 일하게 하느냐 이런 것이었던 거죠. 어떤 인재를 뽑을 것이냐 그리고 이 인재들이 떠나지 않고 계속 성공적인 성과를 내도록 어떻게 배려할 것이냐의 문제인 것이었습니다. 오늘 세션은 바로 이 리크루팅 기술에 관한 것입니다. 이 세션에서는 두 분의 스피커와 두 분의 토론자를 모셨습니다. 스피, 스피커 두 분은 이 리크루팅 분야에서 세계 최고의 경쟁력을 자랑하는 어, 관련 컨설팅 회사의 리더들입니다. 자세한 양력은 이분들이 발표하실 때 소개를 드리겠습니다. 우선 한 분씩 소개 드리겠습니다. 제가 소개 드릴 때마다 이 짧게 소개 드릴 때마다 환영의 박수를 부탁드립니다. Before the presentation starts, I want to introduce today's speaker and discussants. When I introduce them to you, please show your warm welcome. Uh, we are missing uh, the first speaker. I, I, I think that she will come in a minute. Uh, we have uh, uh, two speakers today, and our second speaker is the Mr. Wayne Tomach, the Executive Managing Director of the First Adventist Asia Pacific. Uh, we have two discussion, uh, discussions. Uh, Mr. Ross Hege, senior partner and worldwide chief talent officer of Bain and Company. Uh, finally, let me introduce Mr. Reginald Bull, executive managing director and the head of global HR of the Doosan Group. Today, I want to lead this session with Thai schedule. Both of the speakers may use 25 minutes presentation, and both of the discussions may use uh, 10 minutes each. Then we will have around 15 minutes Q&A session for the, for the audience, and we may also use the time uh, for more discussions among the speakers and discussions. Uh, we are still missing uh, the first speaker, but uh, I should uh, say the we we should start right now. Our first speaker is Mrs. Janice Bryan Howroyd, the founder and CEO of the Act One Group. Uh, before she she come, we will see uh, her DVD. She's the founder of a corporate empire worth over one billion dollars. One is one of the largest staffing companies in the United States. She's taken on the corporate world. Now Janice Bryan Howroyd is ready to share her secrets for success. I'm from a small town, Tarver, North Carolina. There are 11 children in our family. Our mom and dad ran the family like a business. Dad was the president and mom was the COO. And I think a lot of what I learned about life and about business, I learned from how my home operated. My first big customer is still one of my best customers. 
mama was right. If you treat them right, they stay with you. Named one of Essence Magazine's 50 Most Inspiring African Americans and Ebony's 100 Most Influential Black Americans, a committed volunteer and mentor who's helped thousands realize their own dreams. Never once have I changed anybody's life. What I do believe I've done is encouraged, inspired, and shown people how to change their own lives. I will not participate with the naysayers who say it's over for America or it's over for the American worker. What I say is, look at what we've really got working for us and put that to work. Janice Bryan Howroyd is ready to share her secrets for success. You can do whatever you want to do in life. Okay, that is today's first speaker, uh, Janice B Brian Howroyd. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really exciting for me to be here. You know, those of you who visited my presentation on the website, you saw that I had a lot of data up there data that pertain not only to Korea's marketplace as, it, as, as we're looking at jobs today, but data that also pertain to other countries. And that data is quite relevant. I know it's relevant because I've heard it repeated and reiterated by various speakers since I've been here for this forum. I wanna thank everybody for inviting me, not just the facilitators of this forum, not just you, our excellent facilitator for this session, but also the people who have been participating as audience in this forum. You know, I've listened to a lot of conversation about what it takes to create a talented workforce, and I'm certainly gonna share that with you from my perspective. I'm going to need a clicker to be able to share that with you. But before I do that, I wanna explain to you how I would like my presentation to go. Thank you. Green goes. We'll find out. We'll discover together. Um, the way I want my presentation to work is to speak strongly to those of us who affect how work happens, how we design workforces, but also to speak dynamically to the students and the young people who are our workforce, who will determine what the, what the later life of many of us like you and me will be. And so in doing so, I wanna make sure that I share relevant conversation that applies both to employers and employees. It is my strong belief that unless we build and appreciate on the talent we have in a way that cooperates with business, with society, with individuals, we are not doing a very good job. It's a jump ball, one up, one down any given day about which nation leads in what technology or what industry. It should never be a jump ball about which worker gets an opportunity to fully express their talent, their desires, and their contribution to society. Do you agree? Yes. Well, I know some people who really agree. I just left a luncheon with some of Korea's most talented students. These are young people in their mid and late teens who are scientifically going to really keep Korea at the front of the invention map. But what they're also going to do is do that in a way that speaks exactly to what we're looking for solutions from here today. They are going to do it by creating happy people. The state of happy can easily be forgotten in a world that focuses itself on the financial disruptions, the weather disruptions, whether we're looking at weather or finances, the climate is uncertain for many people. These students have the answers. I call them Team WH, and I'm gonna call them out because if they are as committed truthfully 
to their vision for success and individual contribution to the common good, then they will understand why I call their names. These are young Korean future entrepreneurs. Jun Su. Jung Wang. Dong Gi. Chang Han. Yang Sang. Hai Rim. They are here. They are here to hear everything we say about what a good, solid, promising, excellent work environment should be created to. We owe it to them to define that, to design that, and to deliver that. I believe, and I am now there, I believe that we do that by appreciating what real talent looks like. I've seen it at the lunch I just described to you. And I think we do that in business by appreciating the value of talent. Now, there's a doctor here from Boston who you have heard speak if you've attended any of his sessions. And his book called Firms of Endearment speaks a lot to this. And that book was written several years ago. But I'm gonna talk to you about what I have learned talent should look like. Talent should be trained and trainable. What do I mean by trained and trainable? Trained and trainable. We want core skills. We want core abilities. But most importantly, we want people at their core who want to continue to learn. We also want corporations and companies on the flip side, that are interested in learning more about how they deliver as well. And this doesn't always pertain to just their expertise. It pertains to the customers of what they deliver. Product or service, a company should always be open to learning from its workforce and its customers. And the best way to do that is to ensure we challenge ourselves to hire in people and assure through education we are delivering people who are both trained and trainable. The talent in the marketplace as we look at it now must be attitude rich. You know, in my organization, by the time someone comes to interview with me, it's already decided that they could work there. They've got the core skills. What I look for is the attitude. How excited are they about what they want to do? How hurt by society or by business have they been? Does that impact them in a positive or a negative way? Positive work experiences are derived from everyone when each individual has a positive attitude. And this isn't just about, oh, happy me, lucky me, let's be happy me. This is about people who really get it that we are a part of a world, whether that world be working, whether that world be societal, whether that world be political, and we approach it with an attitude that promotes the common good. Attitude is the most valuable asset, I believe, of any country and any talent base. And so, what does that talent base need to look like? The talent base of any organization must be leverageable. When I speak to leverageable, I mean you must compose your workforce of people who can cooperate together in different ways they work. Now, the legacy workforce has been a full-time workforce. In America, that means people who work 40 hours a week with an hour for a lunch break, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. And if you stay overtime and don't ask for pay, you're really great. Then later, as we got into the industrial age, we also added temporary workforce to that. 
a temporary workforce of people who work in different companies. They may perform the same or different skills for those companies, but they do it in different ways. The value to the worker is historically that they've not had to keep them on the payroll when they don't need them. And the value to the employee is that they get to work in a lot of different environments. They learn lots of new skill sets. They appreciate different cultures. And if they're very young, they get an idea about what a company is like before they decide to sign on for life. But today we have additions to that workforce that is lever leverageable. The workforce today also consists of independent contractors. These are people who are their own companies within themselves, and they lend their, their skills to organizations as they choose. They may do that through consultancy, or they may do that through uh, time and, 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 and work sourced engagements. But the workforce has to be composed of many people delivering their talents and their skills in many ways. And the worker of today and tomorrow will enjoy working in many, or in some instances, all of these ways, especially if they are looking for a career and not just work. Talent has to be EQ efficient. That's emotional intelligence. EQ is emotional intelligence. In this forum, we have over 60 countries represented. We have over 100 presenters, professional people who are delivering their skills, their thoughts, their ideas, their knowledge toward helping to create a world that works well and cooperates work well together. People have to have, through their education, through their experiences, and through an and through the, 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 the learning that goes on in their organization, the opportunity to communicate and deliver well. It does not matter how strong an entrepreneur or a CEO or a leader is in any particular skill set or if they're a scientist or if they are, or are an inventor, if they cannot communicate that well, it does not deliver back to the common good in the way it should. We create emotional efficiencies in organizations oftentimes by teaming people. You have a talent. You are able to deliver that very well, but you do not know how to communicate it to the people on this side of the company because they're all the marketing and the branding types. You know very well how to communicate it to these folks because they really do the work and they deliver the product. Teams create the emotional efficiencies that help us to communicate together. With your indulgence, I would like to parallel that. You know, I was told that part of the gift of the uh, ancient Eastern culture is to teach through parable. Well, I would like to make some parallel examples of what I mean by emotional intelligence as it, pertain, uh, as it pertains to the workforce. I am standing here before you very proudly in what I was told is hanbok. Is anybody familiar with the garment that I'm wearing? I think I look absolutely great in it. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. I am wearing a skirt that is designed of a fabric that came from an animal in Africa. Now, where your feelings are about that are not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what Africa has sent forth to the world. And it's been cleverly designed so that the sheen and the suede of it treat the body well and share the light without stealing it. And for the ladies in the room who are really into fashion, and the men for that matter, I am wearing shoes that were designed and delivered from Europe, more, 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 more directly Paris. They're called Louboutin. They are known for their red soles. I'm wearing pearls from Australia. A good friend of mine owns Paspali pearls, very beautiful pearls. What I am wearing is a combination of many continents, many countries brought together cooperatively to present a complete thought.
in this instance, a complete wardrobe. I would not say that my handbag from Korea looks any worse for being worn with a skirt from Africa, nor shoes from Europe, nor pearls from the seas that all of us share from that happened to surface in Australia. That's emotional intelligence. When you can cooperatively create and share and communicate in a way that comes together for the common good, this is what our workforce must look like. This, in very real sense, is what we must achieve. Net present value. Now, those of you who are in finance or any MBAs in the room, you already know how that applies typically in business. What I'm talking about is development of people. Talent must be richly developed, continuously developed. That means that companies are going to have to look at not just the cost of training and teaching and, and gaining experience through, through working abroad for their workforces. They're going to have to look at the return on that investment as one of the richest decisions they can make. Now, I can tell you that in the United States, we have historically done a great job at looking at how to build our companies out. But one of the things that we have not done so well on, if you look at our universities, tell me if I am correct, sir, if you look at our universities, we are not delivering enough American students from grade school to high school into these universities with applicable skills, desires, and talents for the workforce we need. Now, that, some of that is always going to be the case. But we must develop our workforces. We must see the net present value fit in developing people. And 10% tested. I studied under one of the top three CEOs in the world in a course. And one of the strongest lessons he taught to the team of us CEOs was, and some of you will recognize who he is without me mentioning his name when you hear this. He taught us every year, get rid of the 10% on the bottom and hire a new 10% from for the top. Every year, skim the bottom, add to the top. Skim the bottom, add to the top. We're talking about people as if they were, to your point, sir, resources. People are not resources. Read firms of endearment. Understand people are sources of strength, not resources for strength. Dr. So Sisodio is right here. Please let them see who you are so they can know I'm talking about a real life person. Dr. Sisodio in firms of endearment and in his lectures and forums around the world teaches us what I have believed for many years. Resources are depletable. They have a life. In business, we call it a shelf life. Talent cannot be depletable. People are sources. Sources like the sun, like the moon, like the water. And we have to treat it respectfully so it continues to give life. This is how businesses must see talent. And when you see talent that way, 10% tested top to bottom should include 10% at bottom developed, 10% at top integrated, 10% at bottom, 10% at top integrated. It is my belief that today more than ever, there is an opportunity to design and achieve the workforce that ensures tomorrow. We are living in a time where countries more than ever are interconnected. One rise lifts, the, the, the age of one, one tide lifts all boats. Well, 
We're looking at what's happening in Greece and possibly Spain and Italy. We're looking at what's happening in the U.S. politically and around the subject of jobs. And we're looking at Asia, particularly Korea, where you're not feeling it so tight right now. But wherever we look today, there is always an opportunity to design and achieve workforces by developing, inspiring, and allowing people to grow. I would like to leave you with one thought. If you hear nothing else, hear this today. Every decision to hire or employ a person, whether it be yourself or someone else, is a decision for a whole family. Now in Korea, we understand where families will often sacrifice for the education of a child and put everything into that education. That cultural aspect is something that should be a world culture. Every decision you make to work is a decision for your family. Every decision you make to hire is a decision for a family. And it is families that make the world continue to be worth living in. You saw in my introduction that I am a small town girl. I am one of 11 children. I did not know I was poor until I went to university and learned it from a professor. I thought I was one of the richest people in the world because I was brought up by a mother and a father who taught us that education was freedom. I grew up in a segregated society. I never had a book that had all the pages in it until I integrated into what we call the white school my 11th grade year. And I was so excited to get a fresh new book. But that did not mean that I could not learn. So in many ways, you see, I wear this hanbok with pride and with relationship. In many years, my life as a more than 50-year-old woman is very similar to the life of Korea as a country that in the short span of just over 50 years has lifted itself from poverty, from isolation, from ignorance, from war. Many of the same things that I grew up and was born into. But the secret that Korea knows and the secret that I assure you I know is education is freedom. We must remember to value our workforces and to continue to design and achieve workforces that ensure tomorrow. We do that through education, cooperation, and I thank you so much for the attention you have given me. If you have any questions about any of the things that have been on our website, Peter Cavaglio, who is a president of one of my organizations is here. Peter, where are you? That's Peter, very much in the back. Reach out to Peter, but please also be welcome to reach out to me. Kamsa Hamida. Thank you, Janice. I need help. Yeah. I'm not going to fall on this step. This is mm. a tight skirt. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I was surprised uh, how punctual she is and uh, how active she is. And uh, she, I met her uh, two days ago at the, the welcome reception. And uh, every time when I meet uh, Janice, she surprised me. And thank you very much again. And now we will have a second presentation. Mr. Wayne Tolmach will give us his pre uh, presentation under the theme of pre-employment screening within a talent acquisition strategy. Wayne got his postgraduate diploma in management studies at the Waikato University, New Zealand. Uh, besides his permanent job at First Advantage, Wayne is also the chairman for NAPBS Apex chapter. NAPBS means National Association of Professional Background. Please join me to welcome our speaker, Mr. Wayne Tolmach.
Right, let's make sure this thing's working. Thank you so much. Um, I guess the first thing is, wow. I'm really not quite sure how to kind of follow on from such an amazing presentation. Janice, that was truly spectacular. So uh, I'm sorry. You're not going to get the same sort of wow factor from me, so I'll, I'll apologise up front. Um, I'm a basic Kiwi from New Zealand. Um, I'm not wearing a flash suit. I think it's from Barker's, a little place in Auckland. Um, I think the shoes are from a little department store called, store called Farmers, so not, not quite like that. But hopefully what I'm going to share with you is of some use. Now, I've got quite a few slides here, but we are under a little bit of time pressure, so I'm going to kind of whiz through a few of them and just kind of call out the important ones. And I guess my presentation is hopefully going to give you something to take away that you can actually immediately think about implementing. So let's launch into it. So the agenda, the challenge, the solution, the benefit. So what is the challenge? And when we looked at this, we thought about what is the challenge for HR professionals? We're at the Global HR Forum, so what are some of the challenges that have been faced? And we've captured a couple of slides that we hope you can relate to uh, and would appreciate. Challenges ahead, I'm gonna whiz through to it. So here was a quote that we found a while ago, and it was really, really interesting when I was listening to the opening presentations yesterday morning one of our esteemed speakers, the Minister of Education, if I recall, talked about the need to educate. Janice has talked about the need to educate, and that really has been a theme that's come through very, very clearly. And if you look at this quote, it is a limitation in the human resources, I probably should have changed that to talent, not unreliable or inadequate sources of capital. And that has become the biggest constraint in most globalization efforts. And in my simplistic mind, it's that education. We need to educate people to try and improve that limitation. These things never work for me, so I'm going to try and get it. Oh, there we go. So, the challenges faced by many of you as HR professionals. Effectively finding the right candidates with the right experience, the right skill, and the right attitude. And again, Janice talked about how important attitude is. And so what I'm going to talk about as we go through this presentation is hopefully a technique, a tool, that you can use that may help you to address this particular challenge, which is a global challenge. So I'm going to give you a little example. Mr. X, and I apologize, I've got this bad habit of walking around, but I didn't get a microphone, so it, it's okay. So we've got Mr. X. He's an HR manager from a MNC based in APAC. I've got to tell you, I don't see many HR managers that smile like that. So, you know, people in HR know how difficult it is. So he's obviously doing something right because he's a pretty happy HR manager. And why is he happy? Because this manager's figured out a way to recruit talent faster, easier, and more cost-effectively. Sounds like a dream. Let's see if we can figure out how he does that. Before we do that, I want to share just some stats again. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. There is some a survey that was done uh, across a number of companies, and they tried to identify what were the best-in-class companies doing that made them a little bit different from other organizations. Thank you so much. Is that working? Yeah. See, I, I always feel... Can people hear me? Is that going okay? Great. I always feel a little bit restricted when I stand behind a podium. It's probably due to the fact that I'm quite short. So, um, you know, here are some strategies that they asked these organizations to do. And, and, and it showed that the best-in-class organizations were doing these a little bit better. So proactively building and expanding a pipeline, you'll see that the best in class, 53% of them said that they were doing that, compared to 44% of other organizations. But I guess the one that I wanted to talk about was really the strength in your ability to identify talent that is most likely to succeed. To me, that's a really, really important one, is how do you identify that talent that's got the right attitude, that's got the right EQ, that has the right skills? and best-in-class companies have recognized the need to really, really focus on that. Excellent. Um, a few more challenges. You're all HR people. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. You're probably living with these you know, most of your life. I want to share some stats. I'm not a statistician, uh, but I think it's important to give you some insight into what's happening uh, within the industry, within HR, and hopefully some context around what I'm going to talk about with screening. CV lies. Did you know that across Asia Pacific, 
And in Korea, 20% of the information that people are putting in their resumes is incorrect or misrepresented. This is across the board. And I will show you some stats exactly what's happening in Korea versus some of the other countries in Asia Pacific. And these are the kind of common misrepresentations that are happening within CVs. Education. I'll give you some examples around some of the fake degrees and certificates that we see. Stretching dates to cover employment, enhancing job titles. A lot of people say to me, Wayne, that's not such a big deal. Someone calls himself a senior manager, and in fact they were a, a manager. It is a big deal. Because often when you're looking for somebody, you're looking for experience, expertise, and if someone says that they've run a large organization, and in fact they may only run a smaller one, their experiences and expertise may not be the same. And these are the sort of things that we are seeing here in Korea. Examples of fake certificates. It unfortunately is happening everywhere. Uh, we come across these time and time again. I think I may have an example of a, a case here in Korea a while ago where someone who was practicing, I think it might have been law or doctor or, or something, and they found that they had a fake degree. It's happening everywhere. So, uh, how much time? Who wants to kind of guess where do most of the fake degrees come from? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Anyone want to pick a country where they think most of the fake degrees come from? Call out a name. Is it China? Nope. Is it India? Nope. It's not New Zealand. It's America. It's actually America. More fake degrees are coming out of America than anywhere else. And what I mean by that is where you can buy them. I don't know if you've been online, but my goodness, you can go on and buy a fake degree for $50. Literally $50. Um, you can go online and get a reference check for $50. So these are happening, and these are cases that we're finding here. It's concerning. Here's a discrepancy chart. You can actually find this on our website. We, we try and publish this on a six-monthly basis. And, and just to kind of give you some insight into what's happening in other parts of, of Asia Pacific. So you can see here for 2009 and 2010 the levels of discrepancies that we're picking up. Now, I do have to kind of give a bit of a disclaimer here you cannot really compare like for like because some countries have far more strict, I guess, restrictions around what they call a discrepancy and what others will not. So it's more of a guideline, but you can see that Korea is sitting at that 18%, which is pretty much the average across Asia Pacific. And you can see that it varies 8%, you know, up to 40%. Again, you need to be a little bit careful because of the criteria, but it does show you that it really is quite a concern that this sort of information is being represented uh, when people give them your CV and your resume. So let's have a look at Korea against APAC. What types of discrepancies are we seeing? So you can see there in Korea, the biggest discrepancy is education. Is people actually embellishing what their education qualifications are? Um, and then it's employment. People actually embellishing what they've done previously telling you that they've got certain experience when they do not. Oh, wrong one. I had the wrong button. In the news. And this was just from last year. And we see this all the time. So you can see in China, 200 pilots falsified their resumes. In Australia, in India, in the US, in Singapore, the list goes on. And, and this is happening across all levels. It's, it's not just at a junior level. I'm just going to check my watch. Make sure I'm not over time. Uh, I think, here we go, I think that was the one I was referring to in the Korea Times, fake degree holder teachers. So this was a case that actually happened here, unfortunately, in Korea. A teacher was teaching our, our young people, and they actually did not have a qualification that they said they had, which is really, really concerning. So what are some of the most popular checks carried out? And then I'm going to kind of delve into what actually is background screening. Uh, here are some of the most common checks that are carried out across the region. Education, employment, professional, you can read them. The, the thing with Asia Pacific, in some countries we can do some checks, in some countries we cannot. So look, why don't we have a talk about the solution before I do run out of time. So what we're, what we're suggesting is we really, really need to make sure that we're putting the effort in up front before we bring these people on board. And I'm sure Janice's team probably does that. Janice indicated that by the time they got to her, she was more focused on the attitude. 
So I have no doubt that Janice's team is doing a lot of this. So making sure when they get to her, Janice is all about the attitude. When they bring them on board, they don't have these problems. Because this type of uh, solution is widely, widely, widely used in the US. And in fact, really, it came out of the US. And it's called background screening. This is a nice picture, because they always tell me you're supposed to have nice pictures in a presentation. So there it is. But I'm actually not going to go through it. I want to talk about what the actual background screening is. So what is background screening? When I ask people, I say, do you do background screening? They go, absolutely. I go, great, fantastic to hear. What do you actually do? Well, we do a reference check. Oh, well, yes, a reference check is part of the background screening process, and it should be part of the background screening process, but it's not the only part. And a little word of caution may not happen here in Korea, certainly happens in other parts of the world. When I'm ever asked to give a referee, I tend to give them ones that I know are going to give me a good reference. And I usually ring up those referees and say, hey, by the way, I applied for a job the other day. You're going to get a call. I'll buy you a beer if you give a good reference. So you want to be a little bit careful about references. So it's not taking the CV at face value. It is not just a reference check. Um, it's key that when you're doing background screening that you're using information that's available in the public domain, and we can talk a bit about that. And often we recommend if you're going to do background screening, don't get your HR team to do it. Get your HR team to own it, but don't get them to do it. Because there's sometimes a bit of a conflict. HR people are put under immense pressure to bring people on quickly. The background screening, when I share with you the sort of things you might want to do, can take a little bit of time. And so sometimes it's better to give it maybe to your risk mitigation people or maybe give it to someone else. HR should definitely own it, but you may not want to ask them to do it. So what can be checked in APAC? Again, this is very country by country, but it's important that you understand what's available. Because we do have a globalization of the talent pool. And so we're getting people from Korea, we're getting people come into Korea. So we've really got this amazing globalization of talent, and so you need to kind of understand what can and cannot be checked. So here are some of the types of things that companies are doing now that they're checking now before they bring somebody on board, before they put them in front of the, the CEO like Janice. So definitely checking educational qualifications. We've heard, we've seen, that there is a lot of fake degrees out there. Um, professional qualifications, checking their previous employment. If they tell you that they were this particular position, check. Make sure that's exactly what they did. You can see that there are criminal checks. We cannot do criminal checks in all countries. Some countries we can do them for certain jobs. Most companies where we can do a criminal check, they do a criminal check. Uh, credit checks, another one. Again, we cannot do them in all countries. It is a popular one when we can. And it really comes down to what the role is, what access to information people have. And often folks say to me, Wayne, should we do a background check on everybody? Well, my view is yes. Anybody that's in your premises, anybody that has the ability to impact on your brand, anybody that has the ability to access information, you want to make sure they say who they say they are. So all about know who you are hiring. And I'm going to whiz through this. Uh, this is really where do you actually do a background check. People often ask, you know, do I do it before the offer letter, after the offer letter? Normally what happens is companies will do it when they've got down to the shortlist. They might have two or three people, um, and then they will do a background check. Some companies will actually make an offer, and within that offer, it will say it is dependent on the successful passing, if you like, of a background check. So you, you don't want to do it right up front, you know, when you're sort of just starting the process. You probably want to do it as you get near the end of the process, because there is a cost associated with doing this, even if you're doing it yourself. How am I going for time? Oh, okay, I've got about 12 minutes. Maybe I could talk longer. Um, so one of the things is what are the benefits, and what I'll probably do is finish a little bit sooner, and that will give us more time for questions. Um, there are lots of ways that we measure the cost of a bad hire, if you want to call it that way. Um, this is just one example. I'm not necessarily prescribing to this model. It's just one that we, we pulled out. I guess what it shows, if you, if you get it wrong, it can be very, very costly. 
You know, if you bring the wrong person into the organization and you have to unfortunately either, you know, let them go or redeploy them, there are a lot of consequences. And for a CEO level, you know, they're saying it's up to 24 times their base salary. I mean, if we look at the cost of uh, an employee in Korea and then look at the cost of loss of a per employee in turnover, again, stats, you've probably got your own stats within your own organization. I guess the key thing here is if you get it wrong, there's a real, real cost. And so what we're trying to suggest is maybe invest a little bit more time up front and, and maybe do the, the likes of background screening and try and minimize the risk of bringing on the wrong person. You know, there are some great organizational benefits um, in a lot of countries, certainly the US is one. Uh, we're starting to see it in the likes of Singapore where the mass has come out and started to strongly recommend that finance companies do background screening. And for those of you that know, when Singapore government strongly recommends, you kind of do it. So we've got governments coming out and, and really mandating this practice. And so companies don't have a choice. Um, when you do background screening, it gives you a lot of information and a lot of data about the people that you're bringing on. And then you can start looking at how they've performed and so forth. Um, you know, scalability, again, you know, doing background screening, you'll find people with the skills and the talent that you're looking for. Um, there, there are a lot of benefits. Some of these are more generic, but I think there are some really, really great benefits uh, of doing background screening. So I think that's my last actual slide. I can't remember. I guess the key thing, if I can just summarize, you know, we've all heard how important it is to bring, you know, talent on board with the right skills, the right experience, the right education, the right attitude. Um, it's a very, very competitive market out there. The people know that. People know that they are competing against maybe better educated people, people with more experience, people with more expertise. And we've seen, unfortunately, that there is a bit of a trend coming through where people are doing whatever they can to get that job and they are embellishing the information that they're giving you. So whether it's, you know, just part of growth, part of the competitiveness, you know, we really, really need to make sure that we're spending that time doing that background check, check those skills, check that education record. One of the things I didn't talk about was assessments. A lot of companies are building assessments into their background screening process. And a lot of people are saying, well, it's great, Wayne, that you are doing a check on their degree. So you've rung up the university and you've verified that their degree is valid, but how do I know they've got those skills? You know, I got a degree, crikey, 20 years ago. Um, I did project management about 15 years ago and learned how to use Microsoft Project. Don't ask me to do that now. I would have no idea. But I've got the certificate to say it. So again, companies are now expanding the screening process and including assessments. So I think that's the last of my slides. I hope I've given you something to think about. I think we've now got a little bit of extra time, hopefully, uh, where we can get some discussion going. Um, please do feel free to ask questions. Um, again, we've got a website as well if you want any more information on, on background screening. And thank you so much for your, uh, for your time and your, your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, many, many HL professionals here in this room uh, should have found some new uh, fresh numbers like fake CVs and cost of recruitment failure like 20 times or something. Uh, uh, now let's us move to discussion. First, we want to hear Mr. Ross Hagee's view as a consultant. Ross studied economics at the University of California, Los Angeles and got his MBA degree from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Russ was named one of the industry's top 25 consultants by Consulting Magazine in 2007. Now uh, he's working at Bain and Company as a senior partner and worldwide chief talent officer. Please join me to welcome Mr. Hege.
Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, perhaps pass on, you know, three ideas or three things to think about as we at least uh, talk to a number of organizations and also for our own business uh, as, a, as a global uh, firm as we think about the keys to sort of attracting and retaining talent and really recruiting and retaining talent. And I think the first thing that uh, we've at least seen a number of organizations do is start to bring many of the lessons that uh, we would almost expect to hear from our marketing departments or our sales teams. And many times as, we're, as you listen to those parts of your organizations, they would talk about the, uh, the benefits and the power of customer retention, the idea of sort of, you know, selecting the right customers, attracting the right customers, building the right value proposition that would uh, attract those customers to come be, uh, buy your products or services. Really thinking about the power of if you can retain those customers uh, over time, the benefits that those customers continue to bring to you in terms of really references and referrals, uh, the idea that you don't have to replace those customers over time. And so one of the things that we've certainly seen and work with many clients is really this power of loyalty and the idea that if in a very uh, simple way you can be thinking about your employee base much as you would think about your customer base. The idea of uh, identifying and attracting you know, the right employees at the, at the way in and then really building a value proposition and a way of thinking about those employees so you retain them over time. I think there's a great deal of energy and focus often focused on that first uh, recruiting event, uh, but not nearly enough time spent on how you're spending the time, the energy, and the commitment to make sure that you can retain that employee over time. And so one of the things we've certainly seen in a number of different industries is really focused on this power of loyalty. And we've certainly uh, talked and written about it uh, quite a bit. But this idea of a customer, or I'll now use the language of an employee, being a promoter for your business. And if I almost asked each and every one of you to sort of think of your current employer, and if I asked you, would you recommend your current employer to a colleague or a friend? And I'd sort of have you think about that question for a second and almost to yourself on a sort of scale of one to 10, you know, nine or 10 being very high, would you give your current employer a nine or a 10? Or would you give it a number uh, much lower than that? Well, if you sort of think about that metric and you sort of think about that power of that very simple question, and how you might answer it or the colleagues in your organization might answer it, we think that has a lot of insight into what's the you know, power of your value proposition and what's the power of your recruiting message and the ability of uh, your organization to retain talent over time. And what we've sort of seen is that organizations who are very, very high on that very simple but part, sort of ultimate question of would you recommend and sort of put your own brand, your own reputation at risk around recommending your employer as a place to work to one of your closest friends or colleagues, we think that's a pretty telling uh, statistic and a pretty telling uh, way. And we have seen organizations that are very high on that promoter score, that loyalty score, having much greater growth and much greater degrees of profitability over time. And because of what it forces those organizations, those organizations that are great at that, they do a better job of identifying the right talent on the way in, and they focus relentlessly on what is the value proposition they're offering. They sort of think about what are they offering in terms of development and training. They think about what are they offering in terms of mentorship. Uh, they think about how they're sort of engaging their line managers in really building the connectivity with their employees. They think about what are the mission uh, that the employee, does the, this organization offer a mission to our employees uh, that they uh, 
connect with, that they want to be part of this organization over time. And they really start thinking about some of the things that you heard you know, both, uh, both Janice and, and Wayne talk about, whether it's the net present value of that employee relationship, the cost of a bad hire. You start thinking about your employee base in a much more long-term way, in a much uh, more idea of loyalty and sort of focus of an employee over time. So I think there's a way to think about loyalty, there's a way to think about an employee base in a much longer time frame, and I think organizations that start to do that manage their recruiting pipelines, but more importantly, I think they manage their value proposition and what they are doing day to day with their employees in a very different way. I think the second thing is you think about recruiting and retention is an, is an idea of making sure you're spending time you know, I'll call it sort of quantifying the leadership gaps. And it's a little bit, again, of you know, bringing some data and some metrics to bear as you manage your employee base. And it's really understanding uh, both on your talent pipelines in, but also along uh, a period of an employee's uh, lifetime with your organization. What does your retention look like? What does wanted or unwanted turnover look like? How does that look like across different segments, by region, by office? Uh, how does it look across various demographic bands uh, within your organization? There's something to be said of really understanding what are the places in your talent management pipeline uh, where you are excelling, but also where there might be gaps and it lets you as an organization really direct some of the resources, some of the attention, and some of the focus of really doubling down on where your strengths might be, but sort of shoring up where some of the gaps might be. And I think that ends up driving a great deal of focus around a talent management pipeline. And in many organizations, you know, certainly that are global, where we have different needs in and around the globe. It helps you think about moving many of the high potential uh, talent uh, in the organization to where the greatest needs and the high potential jobs. It helps us think about uh, uh, diversity in a very different way, uh, which I think is an important part of, again, managing our global talent pipelines uh, today. Uh, but this idea of sort of quantifying and doing that with uh, some degree of rigor of your leadership gaps, I think helps us focus as, uh, as, as leaders in managing a talent business. I think the last thing I would say is that the talent management uh, function, the recruiting or retention, needs to be a frontline job. And what I mean by that is I think, you know, many organizations have built up their HR teams, their HR organizations, and they play a very important job in, uh, in running uh, global businesses. Uh, I think the risk that organizations run, run is that they let the HR organizations uh, become the solution for uh, managing those recruiting and retention and really talent management pipelines. I think at the end of the day, it's a frontline job and it's the day-to-day -day, uh, leaders, it's the day-to-day -day team leaders who are, need to continue to be the ones that are uh, actively involved in the recruiting. They need to be actively involved in making sure they are part of the energy, the passion, the excitement that people uh, experience every day in the job. And we need to make sure as, uh, as HR professionals that we are engaging and empowering those frontline leaders in the recruiting processes and in the talent management processes, but it's really the day-to-day, -day. it's the day-to-day -day experiences that our people have that I think really comes back and lets an employee answer the question, would I recommend my firm to a colleague? And you want that answer to be absolutely no question. And I think that's going to be because of the set of interactions they have day to day in their business. So my three thoughts would be, uh, one, think about your business as a loyalty business. Uh, and what are you doing to really kind of manage the long-term talent pipeline? 
Second, really think about quantifying the leadership gaps and understanding where those are and really therefore directing your attention, your investments, both on your strengths but also where the gaps may be. And third, just a reinforcement that I think everything around people in our organizations is a frontline job and we need to make sure that we are engaging and empowering the frontline leaders in our business to make sure they are creating a work environment that has people be uh, very uh, active promoters for our organizations and our businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haig. Now it's time to meet our uh, last discussant, Mr. Reginald Wu, Executive Managing Director of the, and the head of the Global HR of the Dusan Group. Many of you audience may, uh, may already know him by the articles on the newspaper because when he was scouted to LG Electronics as CHRO. Before he came to Korea, Mr. Poole had been worked as the HR professional at the global companies. You may expect from his real realistic view on the recruiting and the talent management. Please join me to welcome Mr. Reginald Poo. Um, hello, bonjour, anniversario, hola, ni hao. I just wanted to show you my global credentials before uh, telling you that um, I'm actually going to spend a bit of time talking about Korea. I do appreciate it's a global HR conference. But I'm looking around the room, there are a lot of Korean colleagues in the room, so I hope you're going to forgive me. I'm going to try and take two or three of the things which have been said and put them in what I think is a Korean context. I appreciate I'm a Westerner, so if I get something wrong, I know you will ask a question when we come to the question session in a minute. Uh, I really like um, what Russ said a second ago about trying to ask the question, why would anyone want to join your business? And frankly, in Korean organizations in the last 30 years, I don't think that question's been asked very often. I think most people have said, well, you know, the young guys and girls, they want to work for Hyundai and Samsung and Doosan and LG, and basically all just fish in the pond, and they'll be very lucky if they have the opportunity to join us. So why, why would we ask that question? And I think that has, in some cases, led to a sense of arrogance in the way that some Korean organizations treated recruitment. And I know that in my own organization with, with my, uh, my global CEO, YM Park, that he absolutely does not accept that. His view is that uh, our organization has to prove to possible employees that we're the sort of people that they want to work for. And I think probably looking at the generational change in this room, if you're south of 30 years of age, in 10 years time, you'll have the opportunity to ask that question as well. In fact, you should be asking it now, but in more senior roles, we have to work much harder at attracting people into organizations. I did a piece of research a few years ago which said that when someone is being recruited uh, into a Korean business, they spend about four hours having face time in the recruitment exercise. And four hours sounds okay, actually, until you realize that they're actually seeing seven people in those four hours. So the average amount of time in any part of the interview is 35 minutes in a Korean organization. That puts an extreme amount of pressure on an organization and makes sure that it uses those seven 35 minutes well and in a coordinated way. And by the way, I don't think those 35 minutes are used well at the moment. And I think there's a huge overlap and I don't think organizations are, are ask the right question because they have a different way of thinking about what it is that they want from people. And they're not necessarily asking the questions about what that guy or that gal will be able to do in 10 or 15 years. They're asking very much about fit and cultural fit now. And Janice has made the point about trained and trainability. Uh, when I'm recruiting someone, I, I really actually, within reason, aren't too worried about the next two years. I'm, I'm worried about 10 and 15 and 20 years, particularly in a Korean situation where we all know that people will join businesses and quite often stay for 35 years working through a seniority system. So when I make a career, a, a career decision for an individual in joining in a Korean business, I'm thinking about 35 years. I'm not thinking about 35 months. 
And when I think about that, I have to think, as Janice and everyone has said, about what the world will look like and what Korea will look like in 35 years. Well, what did Korea look like 35 years ago? It has been a huge transformation for this country. In 35 years, do you know what it will look like? And of course, the answer is you cannot. So in terms of the ability to be attitude rich, to have the ability to leverage skills going forward, those are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about in recruitment process. And if I look down the three or four things that I would normally expect to have in my armory to attract people into an organization, there would be these things. The first thing is challenging work. Most people want to have challenging work. My challenge to Korean organizations is, come on, have we really provided people challenging work from the day they join up until the day that they leave? Or are there actually significant amounts of downtime in people's careers where we really haven't found a way to challenge them effectively? Secondly, we need to give people a sense of the future. I'm not always sure in a number of Korean organizations that people have had a sense of that vision what it might look like, what their future might be within it, how they might change within that future, how their role will change. It's been much more based around the contemporary situation. Third one is investment in personal growth. This is normally what people require when they join an organization. In a number of Korean businesses, they have misunderstood training as being personal growth. We train dogs. We help people to learn and add value to themselves. And I've seen very many Korean organizations that will point to their learning centers and tell me about the training that happens there. But when I ask them for a coherent story about the development of learning in people, I think sometimes we may have fallen short. And the fourth thing I usually look for in terms of uh, the retention of people is that people want to work for a great boss. You often hear people say, uh, my boss is great, but my work is not so good. Very rarely do you hear people say, my work is great, my boss is not so good, and I'm happy about that. Typically, most people need to have a good boss in the middle of that, uh, I think you call it happiness, uh, Janice, in terms of how you feel about your life and your career. And I think the stakes for bosses in Korea are rising as more people have experience of a global environment and have a sense of what a great boss really is. So my challenge to all my Korean colleagues is, you may have been great in the past, and I applaud you for that. But will you be great in the future, given the changing needs that exist in this environment? So in my last few minutes at the end of the three speakers, uh, I really would just like to take two or three things which have been said and feed them back to you in the Korean context and see if you agree with me or disagree. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Now we have uh, around 20 minutes left. I want to open this session to, to, the, to the floor. So uh, anyone, <clears throat> anyone have questions or comments? Just raise your hand, we will deliver the mic. And when you have your turn, please say your name and position and uh, the hopefully is uh, your organization and make sure uh, to be brief. Any questions, any comments? Chogis. Hello, my name is my name is Moran, and I'm a current MBA student at Yonsei University. Um, I have a question for Mr. Bull, please. You're talking about um, the HR policy in Korea, and what I'm wondering is now with the MBA rankings changing across the world, do Korean companies need to start revamping what their hiring processes are? Um, well, maybe I could be a little bit controversial. I think that most MBA programs around the world tend to need to make some adjustments as well. Um, my view about uh, general MBA recruitment is that um, we should look very hard 
at the key things that the MBAs uh, bring from around the world. And uh, I think that typically at the moment in Korea, it is quite normal to recruit um, Korean-speaking MBAs, uh, typically from America. Now, I understand the reason for that. But my challenge to the organizations I've worked with in Korea is you really need to think, we really need to think, about what we want from our MBAs from other environments as well, whether it's going to be in SEAD, uh, in Europe, or London Business School, or Singapore, uh, or wherever it might be. Because the slight problem is, is that if we continue just to recruit Korean-speaking MBAs, then you always get what you've always got. And the key issue about diversity in a global environment, like Doosan is, is that we need to make sure that we bring that right mix in from different MBAs around the world. Do you have any questions? If you have any questions, if you have any questions, the speakers and discussions, you can use this translator. 예, 안녕하십니까. 아, 한국어로 질문을 드리는데 트랜스퍼 좀 부탁드립니다. 저는 어, 현재 환영 잠깐만요. 조금 있다가 지금 아직 안 끼셔서. 예. 질문하시죠. 네, 질문하겠습니다. 저는 어, 현재 환영 MBA에서 비즈니스 과정을 밟고 있는 학생이고요. 제가 질문을 드린 점은 다음과 같습니다. 현재 한국 기업의 채용 과정은 일종의 어떤 스킬풀한 그 스킬풀한 스펙을 평가하는 기준으로 많이 채용되고 있고 그 기준이 아 채용 당시에는 도움이 되지만 그 개인이 성장하는 데에는 약간 차이가 있다고 생각을 합니다. 앞으로 조직이 성장하는 데에는 창의와 창조가 굉장히 역점이 될 텐데 그러한 것을 평가할 수 있는 어떤 인사이트풀한 평가 방식이 어, 글로벌한 회사에서는 적용이 되고 있는지 한국 기업에는 어떤 방식으로 제공될 수 있는지 질문 드리고 싶습니다. 누구한테 하신 질문이셨죠? 미스터 불? 오케이. Uh, I alluded to this, to this in the last question, and you're, you're drawing me on it, so I'm just going to give you the answer I think is right. Uh, one of my general criticisms of MBA programs around the world is they focus uh, significantly upon upgrading technical skills, how to work out MPV, how to work out an M&A strategy, how to, and I absolutely understand the relevance of that. And of course, it's something that can be tested and scored. But the truth is that if you look at what makes people fail in organizations, quite often it's the school of the behavioral area, the areas of leadership. And I don't mean leadership theory, I mean in how to lead people. And I don't think many MBA programs around the world have really cracked this issue of how do we help people to become better in the behavioral arena. Now, when you mention the word innovation, you can think about Christensen and innovation as a process. And look, innovation is a process. But if you take 100 people out and give them the process and another 100 people and give them exactly the same process, you will get a different outcome. And that's typically because they bring the human element in it, sometimes intelligence, some aspects of created or intel uh, EQ intelligence. And my expectation is of MBA programs that they need to think much more about what the client requires rather than necessarily what is required to pass an examination. What I would then say is that when it comes to our, our, our responsibilities as a recruiting organization for MBAs, uh, because you asked the question about MBAs, we need to be much better at making sure that we create an environment where we can test those things, not whether they understand Porter's five forces or exactly how to work a balance sheet. Uh, I would admit, I don't think we're very good at that at the moment, but one of the conversations I've already started in my business, because we recruit a lot of MBAs, is are we giving these people the very best chance to show their real talents beyond that uh, which is contained in the certificate? And as Wayne said, some of the certificates are fake anyway. Wayne, you have some comments to add. 
Right there. Uh, I guess just a couple of things, and, and you, you mentioned a couple of points. One was the assessments that may be done uh, are relevant for that point in time. And I think one of the important things, whether it's an MBA program, whether it's an organisation, you, you need to know where people are at right now. And so it's important to do those assessments, and that gives you, a, I guess, a benchmark. It gives you a starting point. And organisations need to do this as they continue to want to develop their talent pool. So it's important to do them. There are, and, and you're absolutely right, there, there are more and more organisations and the MBA programmes could potentially do this as well. There, there are solutions out there that do allow you to, I guess, get a better indication on someone's creativity. They are the behavioural types of assessments. There are you know, emerging EQ types of assessments. So they are there, they are becoming available. Uh, and I think it's important that organisations do put people through these. So one, they can see if they've got the skills right now for what that person's going to do. And then also give them a benchmark to say, okay, this person's at this level. And now as we implement our development programs and so forth, they can go back and reassess those skills and make sure that those programs are actually working. I, I hope that, that helped. Uh, maybe you can proceed. On the question of MBAs, I think that we need to apply the same thought process specifically to the area of whether or not to continue a process or to change it. Ch processes should always be changing because business is changing. Uh, the, um, it's insane to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So when you look at your processes, I'm sure you can deduct this for yourself. My son currently is in an MBA program and it is in a Los Angeles based, you know, Southern California school. They are looking at changing the process there as well. I have lectured at MBA programs, um, UCLA I've lectured. And I will tell you that there is a thirst and a hunger among these schools to get participation back from uh, companies about what they see in uh, terms of need for change. I've been approached in my own company about how to work with these schools to define it. So I think it's a two-part situation. I think one, yes, the fact that you're asking the question about whether it needs to be changed suggests it should. Um, I think how you change it is important, and that means that you don't just evaluate where the MBA programs are that you see in the current marketplace, but you actively engage with some of these schools, sharing back the successes and the failures you see from the people you've hired from their programs before. The third thought I have is I have seen that traditionally many of the people who have actually gone out and worked and then gone back into MBA programs bring a different level of uh, result than sometimes those who matriculate straight through from uh, undergrad into graduate school. And so how do we help them? You know, the idea of trainable, tra uh, uh, trained, trainable, taught, teachable, I think that's an evergreen process. I believe that the big message is if you're finding failure or if you're finding more need from an MBA program, please be participative in this, especially in this new and, and, and continuingly new economy to work with the schools and give the feedback that help them to better meet those needs. Measure the results of what you're doing, but don't just measure them in terms of have they succeeded for you. Feedback where the wins and failures are to the schools that you're working with. They prize their programs as well. Um, I am an undergraduate student in Seoul University, and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Wayne Tolmak about the, about the professional background screening process. So uh, as I, uh, if I have understood correctly, that your personal view is on to, um, to screen professional backgrounds as much as you can to the possible employees or even the possible um, <clears throat> current employees, but um, I, I was wondering about the process that are taking right now, the current recruitment process that the 
the current companies are taking. They are uh, having a resume or a CV analysis at the first process, but they are also having an interview process after the CV assessment. And um, I was wondering if the interview process was intensive enough, wouldn't, would it be, uh, wouldn't it be a little bit redundant on the process with the screening process and the interview process? Because as um, companies like um, Bain or consulting companies, I understand are having a really intensive interview process to screen those like only to those people that who only have specifications and don't have real quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and I think that that's a great question, and it's certainly uh, the feedback that we get. I guess if I try and take some of the learnings that we've had, and I'll go back to what Janice shared, when people go and, and see her for a, for a job, Janice is looking at attitude. So, you know, many, many times when we get to that interview stage, we are looking at whether there is a good fit within your company culture. You know, the person that's interviewing is, is somewhat going to be biased around their own beliefs and, 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 the, and the way that they look at things working. So when you get to that interview stage, you know, it's, it's one part of it, and it's a really, really important part of it. It's a critical part of it. I guess what we're recommending is take away some of the, the fact-based checks, assessments out of it. So when you get to that interview, it really can be about that that communication, whether you fit in with the culture of the company. Janice is probably not at that interview, you know, checking whether that degree actually is a real degree. She, she's not asking that question. She is going to assume that, as she should. Janice does not want to waste time doing that kind of background check. So what we're suggesting is you, you do really need to do that. You know, get them to do some assessments as a part of the check. You know, Janice will have the results of those assessments and she may use that as part of her interview process. So the whole idea is, you know, check all the facts, make sure that what this person is telling you is accurate and correct, and then when you get to that intensive interview process, that's all about more the personal interaction, the attitude, the, the drive, and, and all those really good things that uh, Jenna spoke about. Hopefully that's answered your question. One other way to look at it is, background checks and screening are not the same thing even though they are cooperative to the hiring process. And so screening can screen in and it can screen out. Many companies have a different focus on how they do that. When you're screened, you're also oftentimes scheduled. One can be screened at a high level, another can be screened at a different level. A number one and a number two candidate. A number two candidate who has been screened may feel himself or herself screened out, but at the point of interview, that's when you get the opportunity to jump into the number one position. So I think you should really welcome the screening process. I don't think you should set up bogus interviewing processes for yourself but I do think you should, as closely as possible, measure how you're performing in each level of that process and then learn from that for the next interview or the next opportunity that you go after. But please remember, again, around attitude, and attitude very, very much in an in a academic way, not just an emotional way. Look at the screening process, not as screening you out, but screening you into the environment. If you get to the point that you have an interview, be confident that you've laid the basic platform. And so now is the chance for you to talk about the things, the aspirations, and the opportunities you bring to an organization that may not have been so clearly defined or asked about up to that point. You don't have to go through the screening process and answer those questions over again. And oftentimes, the people you're talking with don't want you to. Savvy org, and, and this is something I hope you will remember if you are in the interview process. You are interviewing that company as much as it is interviewing you. So don't ever allow a desperation to be hired into a brand name company or a situation that's going to pay you a little bit differently than another job will. If you're entering your career, if you're in a position to really make a first time decision, then make it as closely as possible to what you think you can grow and perform within. You're gonna change jobs and careers more than two or three times in your life. 
So really use this as an opportunity to learn about yourself and what it means to you. And consider yourself screened in, not screened out when you go through the process. It's an honor for me to speak here, and I'd like to truly thank for you. And I'm majoring in Korean linguistics and literature at Park Yeonju. You can call me Agnes. <laughs> I'd like to ask to Janet, Mrs. Janice, that I think this question is similar with the formal person, but um, not, I mean, not to waste huge amount of money. Um, we need to, I mean, you need to consider very carefully when you choose the employee, right? Uh-huh. But, you know, in, I mean, interview time is really short. And how could you recognize this person is the right person for our company? And he is really qualified. And he's not just eager to take this work for money, but to um, want to develop and make it better. How could you recognize in a very short moment? Well, there are some very subtle ways that you can do that, regardless of what the answers are. But first, let me address the obvious. Make certain that your questions always engage conversation and not just yes or no answers. You don't ask a person, do you want to work here? Will you work hard? You ask them why they want to work here and what is their best work process and environment like. The other thing, though, I think that you need to do, and this is where that interview is uh, irreplaceable, that face-to-face -face interview, whether done virtually or, you know, in an office together. I think that is you need to learn how to read people, uh, the, the, their energy level, and read the other things. Communication is more than words. Read the way a person looks at you, the way they, how enthusiastic they are about how they are answering the questions. I also think that you take a lot, so that's the second thing. The third thing is, I think you take a lot from a person's ability to perform into the future by how they've managed whatever opportunity or work they've done in the past. Not just in, 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 in terms of what people have done to screen them before they get to you, but conversate with them and talk about where their best wins and where their failures were. A person who has no failures to share with you, no matter how soon in their job or their career search they are, really is someone you should question, you know, whether or not they can be effective in your organization. They're either too self-assured or they're really quite candidly not being candid with you. The fourth thing that I think can be very valuable to you is to talk with them about real life situations. Now, you don't want to cross the line of comfort or legality, but you learn a lot about how successful a person can be in your organization, about how successfully they describe their life. There is no one idea about what a person's life should be like, but when people can communicate clearly with you about where they are in that, you get an understanding of how they are going to fit in your organization because you know better than they do what is the culture culture of your company and how your company really operates. You know, I've walked into many organizations and you see along their walls very identifying marketing efforts or branding efforts about who they are and we think out of the box or we live life fully. You know, those kinds of things are great to market and attract candidates in. But when you begin to screen them, don't believe your own publicity. Ask questions directly that will directly help you to understand how successful they can be. The best way to hire successfully for your company is to hire successfully for the employee you're bringing into your company. And so if your legal department operates quite differently than your marketing department or your research department, you have to learn the cultures within your organization in a way that allows you to ask those very fine-tuned questions during that interview process, especially if your company has a process of hiring people without them touching directly to the people they will work with as a large part of that interview process. I think though that the key here is determine as much as you can whether or not you're hiring a person in who is gonna have an enjoyable and a successful work experience in your company. You put the wood on the fire before you get the heat 
that employee has to really learn quickly. And, 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 and as you've heard earlier, they have to really, employees are no longer loyal to companies, they're loyal to uh, ideas. And when companies can express ideas and ideals strongly for them, they get really invested in the company. You investigate for that at the point of interview, and I think you'll make smart hires. If the employee is happy, your company is going to succeed. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think if I can just add, and, and uh, Janice is absolutely right, and I briefly touched on it uh, when I talked about what organizations are doing in that kind of pre-interview, pre-screen you know, type of process, whereas historically it tended to be I'll check their degree, you know, I'll check their work history, you know, I'll check sort of fact-based things. As I alluded to, a lot of companies now are recognizing that it is really, really important to get the interview right. They do recognize that often, you know, HR professionals are not always maybe, you know, fully skilled in, in, in the skills that Janice has. And this is where this whole assessment type of a, a practice really is becoming, you know, more and more popular uh, and not just um, skills-based but more uh, style-based and attitude-based. And so what they're doing is they're really trying to do as much checking, screening, testing, assessing of people. So when they get to that interview stage, you know, the person is doing the interview, they're reading the body language, they're asking the right questions, and they also have some other factual-based information to make sure that it marries up. Because, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, there are people out there that are very, very, very skilled at being interviewed. Uh, they know what to say, they know how to say it. Um, a, an experienced interviewer can often pick that up, but maybe an inexperienced one cannot. It, it's just the way that it is. In my career, I've certainly made some, some wrong hires. Um, one wasn't that long ago. I hired a marketing manager. She was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Interviewed really well. We, we did the background check on her. I didn't actually do any assessments. Um, I've learned my lesson. She joined us, and after about three months, she came to me, and she said, you know what, Wayne, I, I really like you, and, and I like First Advantage, but this just isn't really the sort of environment for me. You know, she was, wanted a more kind of creative environment where she had the ability to really sort of, you know, throw out ideas, and that's just not who we are. Maybe, I'm not saying necessarily, but maybe if I had to put her through some behavioral type of assessments, I may have picked up that she wasn't really a person that wanted to sit behind a desk and just, you know, punch out marketing material. So it's something to consider. Again, what I'm proposing will never, ever, and should never, ever, ever replace that interview. But hopefully by doing some of these practices, it'll give the person doing the interview more information to help them make an informed decision on that really, really important, you know, um, hire. Thank you. There's, let me ask a question. How many of you are HR professionals in the room? Insa damdang isimian, insa joge kumashimian hampon sondro jushijo. One of the things that I would really encourage for HR professionals is that you be very clear. I alluded to it quickly in answering the question earlier you be really clear yourself about where your organization is or whether the department is within your organization that is hiring. Don't buy the branding part of it at, that recruits people into your company because you owe it to the employees to offer who you hire to offer them an opportunity to be successful. And you can only do that if you are just as realistic about where your company is as you are about what ideals you want expressed by the work of an employee. And so that becomes a very different interview once you investigate that. If you are a product-based company, your product can be excellent and the experience people have working in your organization can be very different than the experience they have enjoying your product. So don't confuse the two when you're hiring, although you should always be hiring people who can help you reach that ideal of who you think you are. I think that is very important. Okay, thank you. We are out of time, but however, uh, the Mr. Ross Hagner has not received any questions, so do you have anything to comment to add? 
I want to be sensitive to everybody's time, but I uh, may I just add on some of the last questions from some of the MBA students. Uh, I, I do think that more and more employers are absolutely recognizing that they need to come and they need to come and listen because they are trying to hire for whether it's the next you know, several decades, whether it is around fit, whether it is around culture, uh, whether it's around having employees that are going to represent the company, their products, their brands the right way. And so I think the interview process is an absolutely critical one, and employers are trying to find ways to engage you around what your interests are, what your passions are, what are the experiences that you, uh, you bring. And so I would just uh, encourage everybody out there, if you're interviewing, spend time understanding the answers to those questions for yourself and be sincere and be honest with yourself. It is a bit of a, it, you need to find the employer where you're gonna enjoy and be energized by what you're doing. And so don't, uh, you're not just trying to get over a hurdle with a company. You've gotta find a company that's gonna be right for you. And the companies are trying to do the same thing. So engage the employer in conversation. That's what the interview process is all about. Thank you, Russ. Uh, for the first 90 minutes, we, uh, I, I believe you have many insightful and informative uh, the discussions. And uh, uh, I believe we had a great chance to, to share global trends and the professional viewpoints. Uh, finally, uh, uh, join me, uh, please join me to show the gratitude for the, today's speakers. Thank you very much, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the global HR forums. Thank you. 감사합니다. 네, 수고해 주신 권영설 환경 아카데미 원장님과 소중한 강연을 해 주신 연사 트로자 분들께 다시 한번 감사드립니다. 이것으로 세 번째 세션을 마치겠습니다.